almost within sound of enemy guns, Allied soldiers in North Africa hold religious services before going into battle. Here, amid the ruins of an ancient Roman church, officers and men of all ranks, British, French, American, unite in holy worship. Men of many nations, many creeds, and many faiths, finding brotherhood and spiritual comfort in a land far from their homes. Like schoolboys on a holiday, they inspect Africa's treasure troves of antiquity. Discovering a swimming pool built centuries ago by the Romans, soldiers welcome the chance to remove some of the dust and grime of the desert. First, real soap and showers. Then it's every man dive in. Natural hot springs forming a swimming hole that may once have served a Roman senator. Pushing on toward Tunis and Bizerte, Allied tanks and guns take up the fight. Prisoners by the hundreds are rounded up as the battle enters its final phase. Some 30,000 Axis soldiers captured since the British took the Merritt Line. Men wearing the brassard of Rommel's Africa Corps, amazed to learn that their leader is reported to have fled. into trucks for camps behind the lines, glad that as far as they're concerned, the war is over. Seven thousand feet above sea level, army engineers survey the mountainous Central American jungle, through which they're carving a 1,500-mile military highway. By mule back and afoot, they're blasting a path through a wilderness never before conquered by man. Today, with modern road building equipment from the United States, they're completing the job months ahead of schedule. An inter-American highway linking Panama and Mexico City. A highway bringing the good neighbors of the Americas closer than ever before. The veil of secrecy is lifted from some of the Army's defenses of the nation's capital. Mobile guns, troops, and the picked guards of the White House are now familiar sights in wartime Washington. Behind the scenes, the Army Interceptor Command checks the movements, knows the position of every plane within hundreds of miles, is ready to flash a warning upon a moment's notice. From strategic positions on rooftops, Troops man powerful detecting equipment to safeguard the capital against the possibility of surprise air attack. From scores of camouflaged emplacements, anti-aircraft batteries point grim steel muzzles toward the sky. In Washington, as in every city, vigilance is the watchword. Time in Australia. Ranchers on the island continent driving huge herds to market 
to supply beef for Allied soldiers at home and overseas. Swimming rivers and streams, cattle by the thousands, the biggest roundup in years. From the far western ranges of North America come picturesque scenes of great sheep herds on the move, seeking greener, richer pastures. Wool for warm clothing, meat for lend lease shipments overseas. The vast resources of the United Nations mobilized for war. United States Coast Guard cutter patrolling the stormy North Atlantic, guarding Allied convoys from lurking enemy raiders. Suddenly, off the port bow, a Nazi submarine breaks the surface. The cutter's guns open fire. to examine damage suffered by the cutter when she finally rammed and sank the U-boat. Engine room flooded, the captain tries to list the vessel while effecting emergency repairs below the waterline. A Polish destroyer comes to the rescue, taking aboard a hundred of the cutter's crew when the skipper is forced to lighten his ship. A Nazi submarine to her credit, the gallant little cutter is towed 800 miles to port. A fighting ship ready to sail and fight again. Flying fortresses, manned by United States Army Air Force crews, bound for Germany in broad daylight. Their target? the big Nazi submarine base at Begasac. The RAF pounding the continent by night, the Americans by day. A combined Allied air offensive that is smashing Nazi industrial centers one by one. Seven of 15 submarines at the Vegasac yard destroyed. War factories and a nearby air base reported blown to bits. Somewhere in England, Allied ground crews anxiously await the return of the raiders. A wounded crew member brought home by stretcher and damage to some of the ships, evidence of the terrific battle the forts waged against enemy planes. Although tails were riddled and landing gear shot away, not one bomber failed to return. <laughs> Lieutenant General Andrews, their commander, later gave his life in an airplane accident in Iceland. His work will not be forgotten, nor his plans interrupted for the smashing of Germany from the air. Thank you.